The following is a transcription of an interview that occurred on July 22nd, 2023. The two parties involved in the conversation are Micah Phillips, a freelance blogger working on an article for the website, Stranger Dangers, and the subject of the interview, an individual identified as Nelson Platt. The website catered to bizarre and macabre stories and apparently when Micah agreed to meet Mr. Platt in a back booth at the Sleeping Robin Diner, there was already some idea that he might have such stories to tell. Hey, you must be Nelson. Well, if you say I am, then I must be. I hope you haven't been waiting. If you don't mind, sit over here at the end of the table instead of across in that other booth. Um, okay. Sorry, I know that might seem strange, but I don't like people directly across from me when I'm in a booth like this. And I also don't want anybody overhearing what we're talking about. Sure, yeah, I get that. The sound of a metal chair being pulled up to the table. So, um, how do you want to start? You were saying in the forums that you had a very strange job with a list of rules. What? No, no, no. I said my job is making lists of rules. And some of my work orders have been pretty weird. So I, you know, have stories to tell. Huh? Okay, well, tell me about the job first, I guess. What kind of rules or um, lists of rules do you make? Oh, all kinds, really. Yeah, but I mean, are these like rules for businesses or schools or what? Usually nothing quite that banal. For instance, last week I created a set of rules for how to survive a night in a house haunted by an evil dead child. What? You're kidding me. Um, I mean, you have to be. No, no. I'm not messing with you at all. So you wrote some tips for somebody to survive a night in a house that's haunted by an evil dead kid. For what? Like the internet or something? Not tips. Rules. Oh, shoot. Yeah, my bad. I wasn't trying to make fun. I think I just don't understand yet. So you made rules on how somebody could survive a night in a house if the house was haunted by an evil dead child's ghost. Not a house. The house. It's in Utah, apparently. And so, this house in Utah, it has an evil child ghost. So they say. And you make rules so people can spend the night there and survive the, um, the ghost. I make rules that, if followed closely enough, they would survive the ghost. Isn't that what... Oh, thanks. No, water's fine by me. Are you eating at all? I am if you are. Um, sure, I'll have a cheeseburger with it, just ketchup. The same, but with pickles as well. So, I think I'm still not following entirely. Maybe we should back up and start from the beginning. How did you get into this line of work? How does any job start? You find it, or it finds you. In this case, it was more the latter. I had recently survived a tragedy that took my girlfriend and best friend and... I was adrift in my own pain and sadness. When my employer approached me, I think that I already knew it wasn't an accident, but in the state that I was in, it didn't seem to matter. I was a drowning man in any lifeline, even one thrown by a strange hand was welcome. I understood the work a bit from the start and I took to it right away. I was never very good at math, but there's a mechanical precision to words as well. I was taught that crafting a good set of rules was a lot like building a clock. Now, I had never known that I was good at words or clocks, but it turns out that I am. Understanding the parts and how they fit together for their intended purpose. My first set of rules was fairly mundane. A man had come to my employer based on rumors and while typically customers without references are turned away, this one was accepted and handed over to me. The man was a nasty sort. He had a kind of intellectual contempt for those that he saw as his lessers. Though from time with him, he was of middling intelligence outside of a certain creative streak when it came to ways to torture his victims. 
He wanted a series of rules that were based upon ancient Egyptian morality. His notes and suggestions were a convoluted mess with questionable sources and no discernible pattern or thematic through line. Those are big no-nos in our line of work and I tried to explain that to him, but he wanted to argue. When I finally pared him down to just 12 rules, which was still way too many by the way, then we reached the next problem. He wanted the hatch to be sealed. Sorry, you don't know what that means. In any set of rules that we make, there has to be a legitimate way to succeed. It can be hard or trickier or whatever, but if you reach the escape hatch door, it has to be there and it can't be locked. Well, he didn't care about that. He was a mean man and didn't care about the process. I went to my employer and asked what I was supposed to do. If this was the, the customer is always right kind of thing or what. And you know what I was told. Screw the customer, only the rules matter. And so we got his rules according to his specifications, but done in a way where the rules were legitimate and had some power, though they were hampered by his insistence on a convoluted and confusing mess of obscure references and poorly thought out concepts. But it had a complete structure that wasn't escapable except by the hatch at the end, which is ultimately all that we can promise. You can imagine what happened next. He tried to alter the rules and cut out any way to succeed. And two weeks later, his first victim was being interviewed on the news and he was found crushed to death in the bottom of an abandoned factory's elevator. Some might think that taking on this job was a mistake, but I saw it for what it was. It was a way of teaching me several lessons at once while also seeing how I would handle the work when it wasn't easy. Did I have the integrity to stand up for the quality and sanctity of what we were doing? If you had asked me that two months earlier, I would have probably said no. But now, well, it didn't take long before I realized how much I was changing, more and more with each new job. And over the last few years, there's been lots of them. Thank you, dear. Man, I didn't realize how hungry I was, but this burger looks great. Oh, great, they put onions on this. I can't eat onions. Would you be up for swapping? Plates? Um, yeah, that's fine. I don't mind them. I appreciate it. Mmm, it tastes great, too. Now, where was I? Other jobs that you've had to make rules for. Oh, sure, yes. So I've made rules that look like rituals. You know, the kind of thing where you do these weird or seemingly arbitrary steps and something exciting or dangerous or scary will happen. Maybe see a ghost or summon a demon or see the date that you're going to die. So you're saying your job or at least a part of your job is making up rituals for magic? No, not being rude, but you need to pay closer attention. We do not make actual magic rituals. That is an entirely different thing that requires different knowledge and skills, among other things. What we do is make rules that look like rituals to people that don't know any better. Okay, sorry. I see the distinction. But can you explain how it's practically different? I mean, if you have a real magic ritual that's designed to summon a ghost and it does, okay. And then you have your rules that look like a real ritual that's also designed to summon a ghost. What's the difference? Now that's a better question. There are several differences. The first is where the power comes from. The second is what the designed purpose actually is. You're assuming my rules are to summon the ghost, when it's actually something quite different. The fact that the person using the rules doesn't understand the real point is irrelevant. That's the third difference between a ritual and the rules. Rituals require specific intention. Rules just require some basic belief and consent. So you're saying that the rules you make aren't necessarily being made for the reasons that are obvious on their face. Like the killer guy who really just wanted rules to mess with people and give them false hope when he planned on killing them anyway. Exactly. Though as I said to work at all, 
the structure of the rules has to allow for the possibility of success. The rules can be tricky, but they cannot explicitly lie. If they offer a path to survival, that path must actually exist, however crooked and narrow. But just because the rules say they're meant to help you doesn't mean that's their main reason for being made. Yes, you're starting to see it now. I'll give you some other examples. So, there are a lot of ways that you could classify or group the kind of rules that we make, but for the sake of simplicity in our discussion, we'll talk about them in terms of what they would look like to the player. I say player because every game is essentially an intellect in well-navigating rules. Conversely, every set of rules is, at least by some definitions, a game waiting to be played. So what kind of games do we make? There are the basic summoning games like I mentioned before. Do these things in this way and you'll call forth this scary or dangerous or supernatural thing. Maybe it's come to kill you or kidnap you. Maybe it's come to be your slave or grant you wishes. The prize doesn't really matter, just the rules. Then there are the location games. Go to this place and do these things just right and you'll get a certain result. This can still be a summoning kind of thing, but it can be lots of different stuff. Maybe this particular spot will let you see how you die or who your true love is. Or you can throw your enemy's name or likeness off a bridge, and they'll have bad luck by the next full moon. But my favorites are these survival games. These can be tied to summoning something or a particular spot, of course. But there is other varieties as well. And they can be very simple or very complex, both of which have their virtues. When you say survival games, you mean like things that you have to do to survive in a particular place or situation. More occupation. You'd be surprised how many of those we wind up creating these days. Oh, come on, you know what I mean. I do? Sure, the rules to surviving Humble Hall overnight. Never go on the Stork River in the moonlight. I'm a park ranger. We have a series of odd rules. I'm a search and rescue officer. This job has some strange rules. I'm a bag boy. This store sure does have some weird rules. And a thousand variations, but at their core, most of them are the same. They are an enticement dressed as a threat. A trap that looks like a shield. A doom made to seem like an escape. You still look confused, so let me explain it this way. In your interest in the bizarre and the macabre and the otherworldly, how many times have you seen stories or real accounts where people talk about the rules for avoiding some dangerous or scary thing? Um, a lot, I guess. Sure. Now why do you think those stories and real accounts exist? Because people find them interesting, and people like to be scared, and people like the ideas of rules that you can follow or break. Well, because people like puzzles and games. Exactly. Especially when there are stakes attached, right? That danger, that urge to test yourself and flirt with self-destruction. That's part of where the power comes from. Take the job once, for instance. Who would take a job as a ranger or a cop or a chef or whatever there is, aside from whatever normal risk that you have to take? You have some weird arbitrary set of rules that you need to follow, or something really bad will happen to you. Why do people want to go to the suicide forest or try to summon Bloody Mary? Why do you think? I think it's the same reason that the best part of gremlins is after they get food past midnight. People crave danger and death while simultaneously being so egotistical that they think they're special. That they will follow the rules better than those that have failed. Or if they fail to do so, the rules won't really apply to them. But that's just part of it. They also assume that rules mean structure which means order which means safety. If they're given a job watching a woman in a room, well it's just an easy well paying job. Nothing bad can come from it. Until it does, of course. But then the point of the rules is very rarely what you would think. 
like these survival rules not being for survival. Yes, like that. Those rules, if followed exactly, should lead to your survival if that is what was promised. But the point of the rules is to challenge and intrigue you, to get you to enter the rules in the first place. And once you're inside, if you make the slightest mistake, well, then you're trapped. So we make the rules and then send them out into the world to spread and grow and infect enough people that they become real. Okay, I think I get all of that, but what's the point? Let's say that I believe you when you and your employer make all these rules up for different places and spread them around like a virus until people pay attention and start believing them. Using them even. What does that accomplish? I mean, what is it all for? Power and control mostly. You know the old saying, power is given and control is taken. That's very true. Do you have an extra pen that I can borrow? Uh, yeah, do you need paper? Oh no, this napkin should do well enough. What I'm drawing very crudely are some of the parts of a clock. Now, one way of talking about these parts are by describing three categories. Power, movement, and escape. In a mechanical clock, the power is provided by a coiled piece of wire called a mainspring. The more you twist the knob in the outside, the tighter the wire is coiled and the more tension it builds. The more power. Now that power has to go somewhere, right? And it does. That kinetic energy is transferred from the tension of the wire to the gears in the clock, moving the gears and amplifying that power even further as it moves from one wheel to the next. But what is the point of the power that's been harnessed and amplified if it has nowhere to go? No way to be expressed. That is why you have what is called the escapement, it gives the power a release and a purpose. It is the same with our rules, our games. The player provides the initial power either intentionally or unintentionally. Their interest, their fear, their arrogance, their belief, whatever form that initial contact and interaction with the rules takes, it provides power and life to the rules, the gears of our machines. Except they aren't just winding a watch or they're going into it, trying to navigate the wheels and teeth without getting caught or chewed up. This generates more power, which is further amplified by the motion of the rules, until it reaches the point of release. While some sets of rules are truly meant as a conduit for sacrifice, whether the player escapes or not is usually secondary. The real escapement is the release and harvesting of the power generated by their passage and the rules themselves. And every time someone uses the rules or comes to believe them, they are helping solidify another structure of control for someone or something. Kind of like a talpa. Like the more you believe it, the realer it can become. Similar in concept, but much more profound. Take hell, for instance. It is, regardless of your personal thoughts on the matter, a very real place, and it is very, very difficult for anybody or anything to leave once they're there. Long ago, my employer created one of the only methods for such an escape. It requires special talent and knowledge, and strict adherence to certain rules. Many have tried to use these rules to their benefit, and all but a few have failed with hideous results. All because they don't know how to properly play with dolls, if you can imagine. Dolls? Oh yes, I know it sounds silly now, doesn't it? But that's part of the artistry of it all. Part of the allure. Why would you go somewhere dangerous in the dark? Why work a job where a misstep could mean your doom? Why would you trust a doll to get you out of hell? Because there's something in us that wants to feel that doom's teeth on our neck, sure. But it's more than that. We also can sense the truth in it. A truth that excites us. That we want to see and hear. Maybe even touch. Even if we don't understand it and that lack of knowing terrifies us. It attracts us like a magnet. Even when we don't know that it's there. Yeah, that brings up another question that I had. What if you don't know about the rules, like, if you go to the woods or the haunted house or you say Bloody Mary, 
or you work a job with a strange set of rules that nobody tells you. What then? You're just immune to it. Immune? Oh no. If a person that didn't understand what a shark was decided to swim with one, would they be immune from being eaten? You haven't paid enough attention. The rules are what matter, not the customer, not the player, just the rules. Take you for example. Me? Yes, you. See, in this place, this particular diner that is hard to find unless it is looking for you, there are several rules that you must always follow. First, you never sit where somebody else asks or tells you to sit. Second, you never eat food that is offered by another patron. Third, you never give anybody anything other than as due payment for your meal. What? Unfortunately, you sat where I requested. You notice the sign up front says, seat yourself. Now you know why. But you... Then you took the food that I offered and ate from it. Nice in the moment, but another violation of the rules. I don't know what you're trying. And then you gave me your pen. That is three strikes, I'm afraid. Why the heck can I get out of this booth? Oh, you know why, I've just explained it. But this is crap. I didn't know about any of this, it's not fair. At what point in our conversation did I say that the rules had to be fair? A means to escape, sure, but fair. Fairness is a fairy tale told by the stupid to console the weak. But why? There's, there's no point, no power. I didn't know about this place or these rules, so there's no belief or whatever, right? Well, that was before. You know now because I've told you and judging by the state of you, I think you believe plenty. Look, I have to be going if you don't mind. I'll take this little recorder with me. Get your story out into the world. I think it'll spark some people's imaginations. Don't leave me. Don't. Wait. Ha. I've got you. You broke a rule too. What are you talking about? The food. You gave me your burger and you said you couldn't give people anything. So if you don't let me go, you're stuck too. Well, that's a good try, kid. But this isn't my place. So I couldn't let you go if I wanted. And I didn't break any rule. No, you did. You said that you can't give anyone anything. Except his due payment for your meal. The food I gave helped you break the three rules of this place. That means my payment is you. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for some wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality that you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Choose from more than 34 weekly, flavor-packed, fresh, and never-frozen meals. Plus, Factor also offers calorie-conscious options as well. Try delicious, calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Plus, with Factor, you can rest assured that you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and features sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. Head to factormeals.com slash mrcreeps50 and use code mrcreeps50 to get 50% off. That's code MrCreeps50 at factormeals.com slash MrCreeps50 to get 50% off.